for lean, you need to be committed as a leader, but you also need to participate that it's not one or the other, and you can't commit and have someone else participate on your behalf. You have to participate yourself. You have to get your hands dirty. And one of the things that we really harp on in the lean training, or the immersions we call them here, is then, you know, after training, how dirty does your gloves get? Mm -hmm. That's really, like, if your gloves don't get dirty, then you're not really participating in lean at all. Hi, everyone. I'm Tracy O'Rourke. And I'm Elizabeth Swan. And we are from GoLeanSixSigma.com, and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast, where we bring you fabulous apps, polls, news, books, and people so you can build your problem-solving muscles. It's a brand new year here at the cafe, Tracy. So does that mean we are older and wiser? I'm going with yes, and that's why we still have a private dining room. <laughs> we are so smart. I know. <laughs> All right, I'll meet you in there. So, Elizabeth, let's hear what's on our first menu of the year. Of course, Tracy. For today's special, I got to interview Lean Sensei Mohammed Saleh of Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut. Aside from being a great guy, as you know, he's got some rare wisdom on how smart leaders drive successful lean transformation. So tune in for that. For Survey Says, we're looking for your feedback on this podcast and for our In the News segment, we go to Ventura, California and discover what they plan to do with the millions of dollars that they saved through Lean Six Sigma efforts. And this month's Q&A is a timely discussion from our forum about what not to do when building a lean culture. It's a new year, so get a fresh cup of coffee and come hang out with me and Tracy. And don't forget, stay tuned for this month's coupon code in order to get a discount on GoLeanSixSigma.com's online training. Let's get to the poll. So we need some input, don't we, Elizabeth? Yes, we do, Tracy. This month, we are continuing with a poll to get your feedback about your favorite parts of this podcast. So we like to play with the format, and we'd love your input. So the question for you is, which podcast segment do you like the most? And we know you probably have more than one favorite, but for this round, we're kind of forcing the favorite so you can only pick one. And your options are the appetizer of the day. That's our review of helpful apps and software. In the news, where we discuss published Lean Six Sigma applications in organizations all around the country. Best books to buy, that's our review of industry books. Today's special, that's our featured guest interview. Survey says, that's this poll, our voice of the customer polls about things to do with Lean Six Sigma. And then Q&A, answering learners' questions. So enter your vote and we'll discuss results next month. Thanks, everybody. I'm Tracy O'Rourke, and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. We'd love your feedback. Please leave us a review on iTunes or on our website, and don't forget to subscribe. So up next, it's in the news. Okay, what's happening in Ventura, California? I love these stories about the good work being done in government agencies. It's so exciting. It's good news for everyone. I hear you. Uh, this article comes to us from The Voice or La Voz. I don't know how to pronounce it. How do you pronounce that, Tracy? You know, I think you did great. <laughs> You're not going to touch it. <laughs> anyway, they're based in Ventura County, California. And Ventura County was concerned because there were some recent cost shifts from the state to the county level. And that increased their burden for healthcare, detention centers, and things like that. Uh, they were also concerned about the impacts of a potential economic slowdown, and they had a great mix of what they went after, and they achieved a total of $43 million in savings, which is already kind of crazy, but they credit $4 million of that savings to their Lean Six Sigma efforts, and they've got now a track record over 10 years of using Lean Six Sigma, and they've accumulated $33 million total in savings in that time, so that's a, a very steady savings. I think they had some one-time savings and one-time returns of money to, to accumulate that 43 million. But what's really interesting is what they're gonna use the funds for. They put aside this money for significant one-time use projects and they named things like homeless shelters or animal services facilities. And this year, they're gonna give about 10 million of the savings to Ventura Medical Center to help them transform the healthcare system. So 
it's just another great story about the government and government agencies <clears throat> using Lean Six Sigma to practice fiscal responsibility. And Tracy, I know you've had great experience with this. Yes, I, I love this too. I actually um, had a situation recently where someone came to me and the way they were reporting savings got them in trouble by their finance person. So I think the lesson I'll share here is make sure you really keep track of hard savings versus soft. Because if you say you've, tr you've saved $43 million in hard savings, people are going to want to know where the money is. Um, where soft savings, it's really more productivity savings and labor hours. So it's not potentially as tangible, still important, still worthwhile, but make sure you're tracking it that way because otherwise people might wonder what happened to the $43 million you saved. Does that make sense? <laughs> it does. It does. Like, hey, what about all that money? <laughs> yeah, what do we do with that money? Um, and so, you know, again, really important to make sure you're tracking soft savings versus hard savings. And if you really want to learn more about that, I would suggest watching our, our webinar, How to Quantify Project Savings because it does talk about soft and hard dollar savings at a project level. Good point. That's a great one. Thanks, Tracy. I'm Elizabeth Swan, and you're listening to the Just In Time Cafe podcast. In a short while, we'll get to hear my interview with Mohamed Saleh. He's executive director of the Lean Office and senior sensei of Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut. But next up, it's a question from one of our listeners. This question really gets at the heart of what people struggle with when they try to bring lean into an organization, Tracy. Yes, so I agree. This one came from our new Go-Getters Forum. We've seen a bit of conversation about it. We thought we'd share it with you on the podcast. So the question is, can you share some examples of approaches that we should not follow when building a lean culture? And I thought that was a great question. I actually don't think I've had that question in the past. Um, and so... One of the biggest mistakes I see people doing when they're trying to implement a lean culture is they sort of get wrapped around training a certain number of people, and then those people go and fix other people's processes. So this is very common for belting. You know, So if you've got belt levels like black belts, what we've seen is people say, okay, these black belts are going to go into and, and, and fix other people's processes. Um, and that it doesn't really work very well. People don't like it when other people that are not from their area try to come in and fix their processes. It's not a great approach. And so really the black belts should be tasked to mentor people with their projects and be on the project team. They shouldn't be leading the project per se. So from a project level, it's important to not use that approach. Really, everybody's responsible for process improvement and you really need to work with the leaders to have them follow up with the people that report to them on process improvement. That's what I would recommend as if I had to pick something, that would be one way not to build a lean culture. I think that you use the phrase, people like doing process improvement. They don't like having process improvement done to them. And that kind of sums up what you're just talking about there. Exactly. How people yes. get involved. Uh, there was a one forum member commented, uh, and I'll quote, having good intentions, this is one of the things they see that you should not do. They see people having good intentions, but at the same time, not fully owning or adopting the lean culture. A half and half approach develops incorporating some of the old with some of the new culture. It's confusing. It makes it hard to know where you stand. And that I've definitely seen as well. And they want to be seen as accepting and they want to be open to, well, lots of things could work, but that waters it down. It leaves people like this person saying they're confused. Yeah, so I've seen that. Another one, this is uh, Wes commented that he sees leaders see lean as simply reducing headcount and distributing the work amongst those remaining. And I think you and I have commented on that technique before is that might work once. Right. <laughs> but once that becomes... Uh, you know, lean means less employees are needed, then there's no other projects after that. Everybody gets the word and goes, ah, God, I see how that goes. So yes, this to me is a very uninformed leader and very short sighted. So if they're looking to reduce headcount, you don't need lean for that. Just go eliminate the people for God's sake. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, and, you know, why do you need an excuse like lean? Because that's not the point of lean. And so you're absolutely right, Elizabeth. Um, that really is sort of actually, I, I think my pet peeve is when we get calls from leaders and they, they want to eliminate headcount. Well, what do you need lean for that? 
just go do it then. <laughs> yeah. Why tarnish the good name of lean? <laughs> go exactly. do what you want to do. Exactly. And then um, the only other thing I could say about the other comment from the other learner or forum member is, you know, the clarity getting really clear on the expectations is really important. And I think it's actually mentioned in the change management book switch. It says, um, the third, the third thing you have to do with successful change is you have to shape the path, show people what they need to do differently, make it very clear what they need to be doing differently. If they have to figure it out for themselves, they're going to be too busy with their other, other work to figure that out. That's a great reference, which is an incredibly helpful book around change management. But yeah, but you have to make it clear those people don't know what the path is. Those are great. Well, thanks to our members. Thanks to the Go-Getters Forum. Uh, we'll look for more. Uh, questions and discussion on the form and bring it back to you guys here on the podcast. It's time to announce the coupon code. So this code is for 20% off any of our Lean Six Sigma training and certification courses, white, yellow, green, black, and lean. If you've joined us here at the Just In Time Cafe, just use coupon code 20 MOCHA. That's 20-M-O-C-H-A during checkout. Make sure to use it soon since the coupon will expire on the 15th of February. And I think I'm going to go get another mocha. That sounded good. <laughs> Coming up next, it's today's special. Elizabeth, give us a little preview of your interview with Mohammed. Mohammed is so unassuming, as you know, that you would never guess that he's running the lean transformation for a major medical center or that he's a professor and pursuing his PhD. There's a whole bunch of things that you wouldn't assume. But anyway, He's a powerhouse, and he's got some great cautionary tips on, quote, how to fail at lean, which dovetails with the four member conversation we just highlighted. He also mentioned a technique which, which broke me up, but he calls it plan, do, walk away. <laughs> what, uh, what does that mean? I have -E to know. P-E-W-A. He's saying it's, again, you know, how to fail at lean at people who start doing PDCA but don't finish it. You know, plan, <laughs> do, walk away. <laughs> I love it. So he's just got great words of wisdom. He is funny, but he really has thought through what works and what doesn't. And it's a great interview for tips, uh, both for what not to do, but also for what to do. He has some great guidance. That's a great. Can't wait to hear it. Today, I am honored to welcome Mohamed Saleh to today's special. He's the executive director of the Lean Office and Senior Sensei at Hartford Healthcare in Connecticut. Welcome, Mohammed. Welcome. You know, when a company uses the term sensei in your job title, you already know there's a very high level of buy-in and that the culture has progressed to a fairly mature point. How many years have you been at Hartford Healthcare, Mohammed? I would say at this point, it's approaching 11 years. And before that, you were Director of Continuous Improvement for the Hartford Hospital. Is that right? They're now the medical group? Yeah. So my uh, so Hartford Healthcare is uh, the system. Um, I started off in healthcare um, in the medical group, and I spent five years as the Director of Continuous Improvement there. Um, then I moved from that into the out of, I wanted more of an understanding around the acute care side of healthcare. So I moved out of the outpatient side uh, in the medical group to be a, a facilitator in Harvard Hospital, which then I was promoted to really have uh, uh, oversight across the entire system, both acutes, uh, our six hospitals, now seven, and uh, the entire medical group and post-acute division. Wow. What a great way to get a really broad view of the entire system on all sides of that. And then you are also a professor at the Central Connecticut State University? I am. I've been a professor there for a little over 10 years um, at this point. And um, I teach uh, several classes there, most recently really focused on um, applications of lean for the master's program for technology management. But every now and then I'll teach uh, project management uh, or other management type courses. So, so that's been going on for 10 years. You're, you've got some, what sounds like a, a pretty good teaching load. So in your free time, you're also pursuing a PhD? <laughs> It is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> there is definitely, um, you know, in, in the spare time, I've, uh, I've really done a lot of research around lean for my entire life, really, and realized, I would say seven years ago, that there's a, a huge 
uh, landscape around understanding organizational characteristics and how that plays with adopting lean, both the management system as well as the production system, as well as problem solving. And really that, that passion of that research evolved into a PhD, which now I'm seven years in and, you know, still pursuing hard. Well done. Again, great. It's all sort of feeding into or coming out of what you've learned in all of these businesses. So anyway, for you listeners out there, if you met Muhammad, you'd be impressed with his, how laid back he is, but you've also got a background in mechanical engineering. You are also a Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and you were a Malcolm Baldridge Award examiner. So you're making me feel like a slouch, Muhammad. <laughs> <laughs> I really have so much still to learn, so um, much more to go. So. That's, the, that's the attitude. That's, that's awesome. So I met Mohammed recently at the Lean Frontiers Leadership Week in Jekyll Island, Georgia, and I got to hear him present, and I was intrigued with his messages about how leadership has to model a lean culture. So that's what Mohammed and I are going to talk about today. So let me ask you this. What first got you interested in continuous improvement? What kind of got you on this path? Well, I was working for an organization before I got into healthcare called Franklin Products. It's really where I got my feet wet. And at that time, they're a division of Boeing, and Boeing uh, is extensive in their lean journey. So that kind of intrigued me a little bit. And then from that, um, I also was a student at Central Connecticut when I was doing my master's in technology management. And I had the privilege and opportunity to uh, be taught by people like Bob and Liani, um, uh, who is, you know, pioneered lean leadership. So really gave me a, a view of lean leadership at, from that lens. Uh, Dave Stack, who really is one of the, you know, he wrote a book, Better Thinking, Better Results, which was one of the first Shingo prize winner books. And um, Mark Deluzio, who, um, you know, many know as, you know, one of the, the, probably the, the, one of the first founders of Lean in all industries, really, and really known for his Hoshan Connery or policy deployment process in Lean Accounting. So I was kind of in the right place at the right time. Uh, I just had these pioneers there and got to see like, you know, their, their learnings from Wiremold and, uh, and Danaher and uh, Pratt and & Whitney. And so really absorbed all that knowledge and got me really excited about it. So when the opportunity came to move into healthcare, I really felt positioned well to have mentors like that at that time. Oh, what an incredibly rare opportunity. And obviously you were able to take advantage of it. That is that's impressive. It's a, it's a real roster of some great lean uh, thinkers and pioneers. Absolutely. So in your present role, what's, what's a typical day in your life? Like what kinds of things are you doing? If I came and watched, you know, Muhammad, what would, you, what would I see you doing? You would see lean has uh, many aspects to it. Um, I'll just talk about this week, for example. We have six different trainings that are going across the system simultaneously this week. So just orchestrating that with uh, my senses and facilitators to make sure that everyone's on point, all the stuff is ordered, the rooms are set up, the, the learners will get the most enhanced experience and all the pre-work checklist is kind of, you know, no barriers got in their way. At the same time, um, I also know that there's a lot of business unit reviews that are happening. Um, and so just connecting with the presidents in the different hospitals and the different settings, making sure their strategies with them and their senseis are kind of uh, on point. And if there's any reds, we, we manage by exception. And so if there's any reds, do we have the right A3s going? Is there any additional support that they need? Anything my team could do to help? So a lot of work on just trying to understand um, some capacity constraints in the system and what kind of uh, initiatives need to be on their way coming out of this week. We have uh, Kaizen this week, so the, just making sure that team is well positioned for that Kaizen and, uh, and, and really just trying to um, ensure that my own leader standard work where I'll round on my senseis and, um, and, and, and see what a day in the life of their life looks like, see what barriers they're running into, but also do skip rounds on my facilitators and get to see them in action, as well as get to meet with them and see what some of their barriers are and, and really enhances my coaching ability with my senseis. Mm. That's usually a typical week. There's always 
sprinkles of emergent things that pop up um, that I try to hold some capacity for to be able to absorb that. Um, if it's just uh, evolving, we have a, we use the shingle model here. So we have um, a bronze and silver and gold kind of trajectory for each department to be able to go upon. And so we're in the midst of kind of redesigning or evolving our silver milestones. So there's a lot of work on that this week as well. So you are defining those milestones or you, they, they keep evolving. What is lean, what, excuse me, what is silver? What is gold? Correct. Correct. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I think we're just learning from our mistakes. So every time we do something and it doesn't work, we look at it as an opportunity and we go back and, and you know, standard work has to keep evolving. So mm-hmm. I know you feel strongly about how people learn lean concepts. So can you give me an example of a time that you taught or you were taught that really st- sticks out for you in a positive way, or you give me a negative one if you want, but I'm just sort of interested in how that works for you. Yeah, I, um, I'm teaching actually this week um, uh, a few of the days, but I'll use my last month as, as a good example. We had uh, some of our senior leaders attend a three-day training around just our management system, and I had the opportunity to be able to teach, coach, and mentor that group, and we had two presidents in, in, in the audience there, and many vice presidents and, and directors. And, um, and, and and that really stuck out for me because uh, it really starts at the top. And a lot of times I'll see leaders delegate lean. So they understand the concept, they understand the framework. And so they just, so they, 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 they understand its execution and they delegate it to people on their team that can help execute. Um, it makes it very hard for the organization to see them as lean leaders. It makes it very hard for the front line to, to, to accept feedback or see that it's not punitive. So one of the things that I found to be a huge success last month was that these senior leaders, uh, not only were they very passionate about it, but I saw the presidents, and, and, and I'll use the two that were there as an example, really take out their calendars and start blocking time where they could go to the Gimba every single day to make sure that they're not just present, but they're present with purpose. And so talked about areas of biggest opportunities in their organization, talked about areas that require more engagement, talked about areas that have the biggest impact for them and both downstream and upstream on their value streams and be able to pinpoint areas that they want to have a routine discipline around visiting, such as the ED um, or um, the ORs um, and other areas where they said, you know, it's situational. Every Monday, we'll understand what our business for the week looks like and the areas of bigger opportunities will go to those areas on the other block. So I was really inspired by seeing people at the top like that really own it and make it something they have to do rather than just delegating it. So that was a big aha for me because, uh, you know, when we first started our journey, it was a, uh, you have all the passionate people that get in the front of the line. Uh, and so you're not surprised when you see that kind of behavior. Um, but, you know, we're 10 years into our lean journey now and uh, really aggressively in the last four years, we really stepped it up a notch. Um, we have an operating model here called HGW, How Hartford Healthcare Works. And uh, to see that that level of commitment still is there with our senior leaders was really inspiring. And that came from them. They were the ones just like pulling out calendars. That wasn't someone saying, hey, how about you guys put this on your calendar? Uh, Yes, that came out from them. That was um, talking about what good leadership looks like, how you could. uh, We we always talk about that for lean, there's uh, you need to be committed as a a leader, uh, but you also need to participate that it's not one or the other, um, and you can't commit and have someone else participate on your behalf. You have to participate yourself. You have to get your hands dirty. And um, one of the things that we really harp on in the lean training, um, or the immersions we call them here, um, is then, you know, after training, how dirty does your gloves get? Mm -hmm. That's really, like, if your gloves don't get dirty, then you're not really participating and lean at all. Um, you might be committed and you might be talking a great talk, but how, how, how dirty are your gloves? And so um, I think by saying that enough times in the training and seeing how leaders could apply it to their own way of working, uh, to change their own current standard works, uh, so their leader standard work is reflective on what they're asking others to do and role model that behavior, I think inspired them to do it themselves. So we did have exercises where they kind of were asked, here's what good looks like, uh, but it was a, they took it upon themselves to actually take their calendars out and block those times off. So I like the words you're using, the immersion is a great word. And then, you know, 
getting your gloves dirty. So do you do follow up to find out if that stuff is happening? Yeah, so we're actually experimenting this week with something that we haven't tried before, where um, we'll be teaching a concept like um, 5S, TPM, total productive maintenance, and uh, Kanbans um, for half a day. And then the other half a day, they actually have to go back to their Gimba and apply all that with a facilitator. And then the next day they come back and do a report out. And then we'll teach them like mistake proofing and quick changeover. And then they go for the second half of the day and they actually go and do that. And, and they come back in the next day and report out on it. So one of the things that we've done a little bit differently, rather than do like three day immersions with a lot of simulations, a lot of case studies, and then have them go out there and do it for like 12 weeks and then come back for the next immersion, because they're kind of milestone immersion trainings uh, to do a report out. We actually try now to uh, go see and do during the training itself so that it, you, we, we get to be able to coach, uh, teach, coach, and mentor while they're still part of the training. So that'll be something um, that's new. Uh, with regards to like daily management or like strategy deployment, uh, we do, we've been doing it that way where they actually have to run a board during training itself we give people characters where they could play difficult people in a huddle or non-engaged or super engaged people that try to monopolize the whole huddle just to see how that leader is going to react when they're running a huddle. Mm -hmm. um, and we, they spend like a half a day just doing it over and over and over and over again until they gain mastery level experience of just how to deal with these, all these different scenarios and situations. Um, and then we actually, for 12 weeks, we have a facility that goes out there and at least twice a week meet with them and observe their huddles, give them feedback, and uh, check their progress. I love the idea, uh, the thing you're experimenting with, where it's teach a concept, then go uh, do it with a facilitator, and then report out. It's almost like a um, single f piece flow with a concept, like let's follow this all the way through with 5S or with mistake proofing. Like let's take it all the way through. And I, I think that's probably... I'd love to hear what happens with it, but it feels like that would have really high Im impact in terms of retention because you stick with it until, you know, they've done it, reported, get the feedback. Like that's a really nice rounded learning. Yeah. No, I, I, you, you hit on something like really critical there because uh, we did have to do a Kaizen around this training because when we go out there and we don't see sustainment in 5S or our standard works are kind of like handicapped or handcuffed, they're, they're not improving anymore. Uh, there's a level of reflection of how did we teach this um, and what, how, do, how did we contribute to this problem uh, and what do we own that we could go back and redefine our training. And, and someone did say, well, we're kind of batching this. Let's think of like creating a cell here and having them actually be part of the process while we're doing it. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll definitely report back on how that went. It's interesting because just as a, as a trainer or a coach, I remember that moment, you know, I've been at this for 25 years. I remember that moment of realizing, oh, if they don't get it, then that's on you. Like you're going to have to change the way you teach this because, you know, it's, oh. it's, it's up to you to make sure it comes all the way through. Yeah, absolutely. When, um, when I first started um, at Hartford Healthcare, Dave Stack uh, was uh, one of my mentors, uh, and it still is. And I would tell him that, you know, I, I've, I've done this training, and I came back, and it's, they're just not getting it. And he would always say, well, there is no bad student. There's only a bad teacher. So uh, <laughs> That's a good, I'm I, 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 was, I was raised with a lot of tough love. <laughs> It all, clearly three, it worked. all three of my mentors were very, um, were, were very inspiring and, and really molded me to where I am today. But it was, there was a lot of tough love there. Was, <laughs> they, were, they were candid. They were just candid, Mohammed. Yeah, candid direct. <laughs> okay, it works. You learned. Absolutely. So another thing uh, I know you feel strongly about is, and I've seen this, so I'm just curious to hear you, your take on it, is that we deal with people who immediately feel they've got to establish return on investment for, you know, a lean program. But simply focusing on ROI means you miss out on a lot of the advantages of lean transformation, and it might even sort of pervert the effort. So how do you counteract that focus on ROI? I, I love what you're saying. I'm going to, if you don't mind, just expand the definition a little bit. Okay. I think I've discovered that there is a recipe to fail at lean. <laughs> so Ooh, I like this. <laughs> If you want to fail, there's a few things that you could do <laughs> that will 
guarantees a successful failure in a lean transformation. I think the first one, and, and they're not in this order, but they're, they're, these are just bullets that I think are critical mistakes that leaders make. And the first one is trying to capture or quantify an ROI. I think when you do that, then you're missing the whole boat around what a cultural transformation looks like. Um, you, you, you're not, you're, you're really approaching it from, as a tool-based architect. You're not really approaching it from a system-based architect. Um, and so you have no principles. And any foundation with no principles usually fails. Mm -hmm. And so when you try to approach it from an ROI standpoint, then you're really, really going after this as a flavor of the month. And you might say to yourself, you're not as an organization, but you are. Um, there's no doubt that a lean transformation will give you ROI. There's a lot of doubt if you approach it with that being the reason you're doing it, because then you start reverting to behaviors that are unhealthy and you're not willing to spend the time teaching, coaching, and mentoring. There's no price to pay for a VP that says no to consultants because they know how to do an A3 themselves and they know how to understand and diagnose the problem and come up with the root causes. And they have enough engagement and motivation of their organization to be able to come up with their own solutions. That's priceless. You can't put an ROI to that muscle. Um, does, so when or does saying that to people, to leaders get through when you say that? When um, leaders approach you initially around wanting to start on the lean journey, um, and start talking about ROI, or you're engaging with leaders already in a lean journey who are starting to want to quantify ROI. There's a responsibility that we have as lean practitioners to, first of all, not criticize that because that is the only problem-solving muscle that they view lean from. So the, our responsibility is to be able to teach, coach, and mentor the perspective of how this is principle-based. Um, and without uh, calling it out. Uh, so there's a few questions when you're starting a lean journey that you should be asking that helps you avoid such questions. Or like, I had one leader and they tried to want to understand that, hey, we did all these things. Where's the proof that it actually works? And uh, what's the ROI behind it? And so my first question was, what's the cost of not doing this? Have we ever tried to quantify all the mistakes the defects that we're getting, um, uh, all the meetings that we're scheduling, all the firefighting that we're doing, what's the cost of that? So I usually challenge leaders to try to quantify what the cost of that is. And the majority of the time, they'll tell me it's unquantifiable. But what that does is that it helps the leaders understand the value of capacity, uh, the, the, the critical nature of how hard it is to quantify a culture. And steers the conversation away from ROI and more around, so why do they have that many meetings? We've had this ED issue um, for the last 11 years, and we've been talking about it every other week for an hour meeting, and we're still spinning our wheels around the exact same issues that we had. And um, ORs, we still had the same exact scheduling issues with ORs or on-time starts. Um, or uh, discharge in the hospital settings, um, or admissions in home care, um, you'll notice that there's a, they're spinning their wheels around firefighting around problems that have been there forever. And there's a cost to that. So I would rather than tell them that lean is, you know, don't try to quantify lean from an ROI perspective. I would steer the conversation around, why don't we qu quantify the cost of not doing lean? That's brilliant. Um, I what, love it. Yeah, it's just, it's a, it's a different uh, perspective. You did ask me, uh, what are some of the mistakes that leaders make? And I told you the, that the biggest one is ROI. But close second to that, I would say um, it, it's, it's head cut reduction. Um, because a lot of times leaders um, don't have the problem solving muscle to do waste elimination. Uh, they don't know what waste elimination is. Uh, they understand what expense reduction is, but they don't understand what waste reduction is. So when you're in an organization that's in survival mode and uh, and you you chose to uh, chose to do lean, um, that's someone who's really uh, who has a serious health condition who has to lose a significant amount of weight in a very short time. And um, the workout plan for that individual is very different than someone who's already healthy who's just running on the treadmill twice a week. Um, and so the approach around that is um, understand their critical nature because if, there's, if they don't do something, the organization will close its doors. 
and then there will be nothing to improve upon. But there's also an approach that could be taken where you could stay away from your most critical ingredient or asset, which is your staff. So acknowledge that they have a crisis. Don't tell them to not cut or do layoffs without giving them a pathway or teaching them how to do waste reduction. However, a recipe for disaster is eliminating people. That is the, the, the worst thing you could do in a lean transformation. Uh, that will paralyze the organization significantly and, and probably be one of the biggest mistakes that you won't be able to recover from. Yeah, there's no, there's no moving forward after you do that. Then the message is very clear. You get involved in this. You, you risk your job. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, and sometimes because there's an ROI component, they kind of are linked very closely with each other. So we have methods that we use to help leaders you know, how do we redeploy people? How do we repurpose people? How do we manage attrition rates with the improvement work? So if we have a 10% attrition rate each year, could we free up enough waste at a 10% rate so that as people are retiring or there's an attrition that's happening or people are leaving the organization that we could in the same exact time not backfill that, but be ahead proactively about it, that we're eliminating waste so that when that time comes that we can match attrition with waste reduction. There's changing up people's jobs. There's, um, there, there's many things that you could do to, 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 to save individuals uh, and stay key, keen on waste reduction. However, leaders are usually, in the beginning of a lean journey especially, they don't have that muscle yet. Mm. So you just acknowledge when you walk in and, and that's all they know that you don't say, well, you can't do that. Well, you have to, they have to be able to do something. Yeah. Um, and just acknowledge as a lean practitioner that the level of intensity that's required on your end is much higher as well. And you need to partner with that person to help them solve their problem. Uh, so that's, I would say, another area that uh, links really closely with ROIs. Yeah. An area that doesn't link that much to ROIs, but it's, uh, it's a trap that leaders fall into is cherry picking lean. Now, many leaders get attracted to lean through, uh, I would say, what, window dressing stuff, the, the physical things. Um, and the physical things, it could be a, a visual board, it could be a nice 5S area, it could be metrics on a dashboard. Uh, there's many, you know, it could be an X matrix. There's many different aspects that attracts different senior leaders uh, or leaders in that matter to wanting to do lean. I think the trap is that they get attracted to the superficial stuff and uh, lean is really everything you can't see. It's not what you can see. And so they sign up for lean without knowing really what they're signing up for. So a level of education around how this is a, this architect is, is, is holistic, uh, that it's not about tools and actually staying away from tools and really focusing on behaviors up front. I think is a critical aspect, but once you start cherry picking tools, you might as well just, you know, uh, just just put a date for your 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 lean journey to end. <laughs> and uh, yeah, like, and, and it might be even accurate if you just plan out, you know, uh, three years out, you'll probably that's 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 probably when your lean journey will end, uh, because you're not approaching it from a place where you're evolving an operating system, uh, you're 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 just band-aiding a symptom, mm. um, and. We all know that when you band-aid symptoms, uh, that doesn't get to the root cause. And there's a, a root cause issue in the fabric of that organization that you have to address. And, uh, and that's in their operating model. And, and that takes time and it takes a whole new architect. Uh, so that's another area I would say leaders really need to be keen to because they usually cherry pick tools because they want to get quick wins or quick ROIs. Yeah. And it's, it's understandable. It's human. You know, they've, they're being measured. That could be that, you know, someone's looking at their department saying, you know, how can you be more efficient and do more with less? I mean, everyone's under pressure, but to your point, it's, it's just going to mean that this is a lot of energy that's going to be ultimately wasted. Um, and I like your point of most of, most of what's important is invisible and it's the, it's behavior, it's behavioral. And that's where you want to start. Let me ask you this. These are, and these are great cautionary, sort of nice framing around kind of what really happens in a lot of leadership that we, we've seen it and we know where, where it's going to go. I love your ideas of just reframing the questions, you know, turning it back to, you know, what's it cost you to operate the way you do? And that these are great sort of warnings. But let me flip it on the other side and tell me, what is your favorite part of what you do? A great question. What's the favorite part of what I do? I love helping people. I love seeing people grow. 
that that's probably my most um, uh, the thing I appreciate the, the most in this. Um, being part of an organization that's founded on lean principles is very rare. Uh, being in an organization that lives and breathes the behaviors that's really really hard to see. Uh, but it's and it takes a lot of work to do. And when or when you visit organizations, it's it's almost it's, it's almost invisible to you unless you live the culture a little bit. Um, so I, I love able to get leaders to say, hey, we're not firefighting anymore, or you know, I own this, I contributed to this problem. Um, when any issue goes up, they're not blaming people, but they're owning it themselves. You see growth not just in the physical operating model of the organization, but you see growth in the people themselves. That's what gets me going, uh, is to be able to see a leader defend an A3 because they truly understand the root causes and understand that you know that that they, they have a responsibility around resolving those root causes. We I, I've seen over the years a lot of people do plan do walk away. I'm not sure if you're familiar. <laughs> no. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, it's uh, P D W A. And do walk away. Um, and so, uh, I think one of the things that motivates me too is that when leader standard work is followed and adhered to, then there's an acknowledgement then that any A3 that evolves into a standard work has full commitment and participation by the leaders in the chain of command. It's how they work. It's not something added to their work. It is actually their work. Um, we thought really hard when we came to name our operating model, what it's going to be, and our COO and, uh, and president of Hartford HealthCare called it um, how Hartford HealthCare works, HCW. It's just how we work. It's just what we do. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not something added. It's not something that is going to come and go. It's just it's 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 how we're wired. It's it's what we do, and in and in, in, in doing gimbal walks and being out there and rounding and doing waist walks and and using that information to coach uh, rather than punize. That 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 is it, it, that's just what we do, and so I think that's what motivates me the most is that seeing an organization really embrace lean from principles and um, are able to grow professionally as well as the organization is growing. So it's a win-win for both sides. You are so right that it's r- rare and it's a privilege in listening to you. It makes me wistful, like how lovely. It's obviously the, an organization that embraces the behavior on every level. And it's in, it's great listening to you talk about your joy as a leader in bringing up other senseis and uh, helping people grow, watching them grow, seeing kind of the fruits of, of good leadership. And then and just I'll reflect on, I actually met one of your senseis, Heather, before I met you. And she was just part of a table breakout. We were doing lean coffee and having discussions. And I just realized right away, she's just this lovely facilitator, sort of both gentle and questioning, but also uh, really help the group coalesce and move through our topics. And so I kept talking to her and then I met you separately. And then I found out, oh, you're from the same organization. Like, <laughs> Well, that makes total sense. These are two very forward-thinking individuals. So really lovely that I, I saw that in action. So um, just for our listeners, Muhammad is not whistling Dixie. So um, can, uh, how can somebody find you or communicate with you if they wanted? Uh, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I would use uh, I'm on LinkedIn. Um, uh, you know, I could uh, I could go into a lot more details on different things. Uh, I could even convince you not to do lean because um, you know you don't, you don't want to do it and then stop. You might as well just not start. Um, and so, if you want to bounce those questions or ideas, um, I would use the LinkedIn account. Uh, that would be the the best way. Uh, Mohammed M O H A M E D Saleh S A L E H um, I'm on LinkedIn. I'm always willing to help anyone that needs help. I'm always with even help being a sounding board if someone wants to bounce something off me and just get a reaction. Um, and uh, I'm also there if someone just on their lean journey needs to vent. Uh, we uh, I, Lean journey is, uh, is one of the hardest jobs, I, I feel, um, if you're a facilitator a practitioner um, at any level, uh, all the way up to a sensei, we, we often need each other. So um, I'm, I'm always available and willing to help. Um, that's such a lovely offer. And I can attest, uh, Mohammed's very responsive. And uh, that's, that's lovely. 
uh, as a sort of an offer for people to reach out. You've been listening to the Just in Time Cafe podcast. My guest today has been Mohamed Saleh, the executive director of the Lean Office and senior sensei at Harvard Healthcare. Thank you so much for sharing your experience with our listeners, Mohamed. Thank you. And thank you for having me. It was such a pleasure to talk to you and, and to the audience. Thank you. Tune in Tuesday, January 22nd for Elizabeth's webinar titled How to Use Control Charts. And check out this month's Wonder Woman of Quality, Tracy Richardson, a joy to work with. She is the co-author of the Shingo Prize winning book, The Toyota Engagement Equation. And if you don't know about it, there's the first global convention on organizational excellence coming up on May 2nd through the 3rd in Orlando, Florida. This one is spearheaded by another Shingo Shingo Prize winning author Karen Ross, and it's a completely interactive convention focused on operational excellence, creativity, and innovation. It features learning cohorts with keynoters, and you get to learn with colleagues from all over the world. Are we going to that? Yes! <laughs> <laughs> I want to learn! Me too. And tune in next week when Tracy interviews David Umstadt, author of Lean Project Delivery. Hey, thanks for starting your year off with a bang at the Just-In-Time Cafe. See you in two weeks. <laughs>